Hello gentlemen, welcome to our video on section 4.2 called precipitation reactions. Now reactions that result in the formation of an insoluble product are called precipitation reactions. When something is insoluble, that means it does not dissolve in water, which is typically our solvent. So when something does not dissolve in a solvent, it's called insoluble. If it does dissolve, it like if I took you know salt and I put it in water, it would dissolve, that is soluble. So we have soluble versus insoluble. When a product forms and it does not dissolve in a solvent or water, we call that an insoluble product. Now a precipitate is an insoluble solid formed by a reaction in solution. So that solid that does not dissolve, we call it a precipitate. Now down here I have an example from your book. I have one compound or one compound here in solution, potassium iodide. It's here in this beaker. And then in the other beaker here, I have lead to nitrate. Now they're separate now. Alone, they are both, as we see in the chemical equation down here, aqueous, meaning they're dissolved in water. They're, you know, electrolytic solutions. But when I add them together here in, in picture two, something happens. You can see a yellow solid forms. Now it isn't just like a, you know, go straight to solid. It's in the midst of liquid, so it's going to look milky as it does, as you can see here. But it is a solid. So what's happening there is that the ions from potassium iodide and lead to nitrate have swapped places and have joined forces. So if you can see on the right side here, the product. This book is actually wrong. This is, from your, this is from your book, and the second product here is actually wrong. We'll fix that in a moment. But we have the what used to be nitrates and potassiums over here. So the K plus in the NO3 minus over here. And then on this side, we have the lead and the iodide. They've come together. So lead and iodide have come together, and as you can see, it's formed a solid here. Solid. And the other product isn't potassium iodide, it's potassium nitrate. That's a mistake by your book. But let's go through this process a little bit more in depth. So precipitation reactions occur when pairs of oppositely charged ions attract each other so strongly that they form an insoluble solid, meaning the water molecules that are present are not strong enough to separate the ion significantly, meaning solvation does not occur. In our last lesson, we talked about solvation um, when a solid is put into water. Water can sometimes be strong enough to tear those ions apart and then surround them, keeping them separated. But in a precipitation reaction, we put two ions that are so strongly attracted to one another that water cannot keep them separated. So they come together and they stay together, meaning water can't dissolve them. So we see them in the form of, of a precipitate at the bottom of the beaker. Now, there are some guidelines that help us determine whether a certain product will be soluble or insoluble. Now, solubility is a measure of the amount of a substance that can be dissolved in a particular amount of a solvent at a certain temperature. And there are these rules that can help us determine whether something's going to be soluble or insoluble. We call them solubility rules. Now, <clears throat> in these boxes here, I have two major categories. I have the soluble category and the insoluble category. These white boxes here tell me what type of substances are usually soluble. And down here at the bottom, this tells me what substances are usually insoluble. Now to the right, however, here we have some exceptions. Meaning, if we take uh, the halides for example here. If a compound contains chlorine, a chloride ion, it will be soluble unless that chlorine is bonded with silver, mercury, or lead. 
So for example, let's say I had a compound that was PBCl2. The first thing I do, number one, note the ions present in the reaction, and two, consider the possible cation and anion. So first, my ions are Pb2 plus and Cl1 minus, if I uncross this formula. So I look at this chart here, and I figure out, well, where are these particular ions? I look for them. So in the top part, let me look. Let's see. I can find chlorine. Chlorine is here, and chlorine is under the soluble compounds category. So I can immediately say that I think chlorine will be soluble meaning it will dissolve in water. However, before I can make that distinction, I have to check the exceptions category. So chlorine is soluble except when it's bonded to lead, and here we have lead 2 plus. So, sure enough, actually lead is, I mean, sorry, this lead 2 chloride compound is insoluble. We denote insolubility with letter S here. So beside that chemical, like we would write AQ for aqueous or G for gas, we write S for solid when it's insoluble. So let's try some examples. So here's an example of magnesium nitrate reacting with sodium hydroxide. They're both aqueous in solution, meaning they both are soluble as is. However, when they react together, we have to think about the ions in solution. So we have magnesium 2 plus and NO3 one minus if I uncross that formula and we have Na plus and OH minus if I think about those ions. Now in this reaction, the precipitation reaction, the cation from one um, ionic compound goes with the anion of the other. So on this side I'm going to have Mg2 plus and OH one minus coming together. That's a 1 minus up there. And on the other side I'm going to have the cation here with the anion there. So I'm going to have Na plus and NO3 1 minus. Now those are just my ions. Now I'm going to put them together to f actually formulate uh, compounds. So cross that over and I get MgOH2 and NaNO3. Now my job is to use a solubility chart to determine whether these new compounds that I've just formed are going to be insoluble or soluble. So I look at the things involved here. I have magnesium, hydroxide, sodium, nitri and nitrate. I obviously um, only handle each compound at a time. So I don't, I don't bunch them all together. I say, well, what about the magnesium and hydroxide? They've come together first. So I look for one of those things, magnesium or hydroxide on my chart. Well, if I look at the insoluble compounds, I happen to see hydroxide right here. So hydroxide is generally insoluble unless hydroxide is bonded to one of these. Hydroxide is not bonded to ammonium. It's not bonded to an alkali metal. It's not bonded from a group to a group 2A metal that's below calcium. It is bonded to a group 2A metal, magnesium, but magne magnesium is above calcium. So we have determined that magnesium hydroxide is insoluble, so it's going to be a solid that forms. So it is our precipitate. And next we look at sodium nitrate, NaNO3. And nitrate happens to be here. It's under the category of universally soluble, meaning there are no exceptions. If nitrate's there, if acetate's there, if chlorate's there, any of these are there, it's going to be soluble. We represent soluble with an AQ for aqueous. Here's our last example. We have copper 2 chloride react reacting with um, silver chlorate. Now I'd like you to use the solubility chart to predict the products 
well, predict the products because you know this is a double replacement reaction. And then once you've predicted the products, you can determine the solubility of the two substances that form. To help you out a little bit, precipitation reactions are also called exchange reactions, metathesis reactions, and double replacement reactions. We've talked about what double replacement reactions are, so use those old notes to think about the format of a double replacement reaction and use the example that I just gave in the slide before this and answer this problem. Gentlemen, take notes. Adios.